Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Wallace here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm an evolutionary epidemiologist with the People CDC here with an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the second part of our two-parter, exploring the media, following the feds, and declaring the pandemic over while Americans keep getting sick. In the first part, we cover the state of global COVID and the state of U.S. COVID, including the latest in long COVID and David Leonard's New York Times declaration that the pandemic is over. In the second part here, we address the why the political class and their corporate contributors are trying to bury the pandemic as a social phenomenon, even as they continue to act to protect themselves from the virus. We begin with a big picture overview, like back to the bubonic plague kind of overview. In separate waves over hundreds of years, the plague pinged about in bouts of five to 10 years at a time. Millions on a much less populated earth died. A Hong Kong team showed such outbreaks statistically associated with overland and marine trade routes. Now, a global north placing itself ever on the edge of its own ruin, one lucrative business deal after another, got bored with COVID in only two years. Somehow, it's expected that such an expression of the capitalist unconscious is resolved by declaring victory, as the U.S. did in Vietnam, and sending everyone back to work. The death drive is meant as such a bedrock cultural instinct as to inflict the whimsy of a dream. As we'll talk about later here, it's been argued seriously that those still working remotely risk ill health sitting all day at home as opposed to sitting all day at work. As the public health left long warned, the virus didn't get the memo. Practitioners outside imperially Rewarding departments argued rolling back all those non-pharmaceutical interventions and giving up on the very vaccine campaign the capitalist state claimed their exit is permitting one SARS-2 sublineage after another to experiment with the collaboration between host adaptation here on the x-axis and immune escape there on the y. And so we find ourselves as shown here, e.g. 0.5, the Eris variant there in red is surging. Only one of hundreds of sublineages still kicking the immunity tires at both the individual and population levels. Friends from different parts of the country posted positive tests the other day, representing hundreds of thousands others that day alone, while the White House once again follows its donor class fighting to get people infected at work. From the vantage of this state, the site of its constituency's sole worthy identity. Omicron may represent lesser mortality in, in the acute infection, but deadly and debilitating long COVID is still hitting people on the back end. Neuropsychiatric syndromes, including Parkinson's-like symptoms and affective disorders, heart and endothelial damage with micro and macro clots and cardiac events, pulmonary fibrosis and outright pancreatitis, among many other visceral morbidities. Now, many millions may be fine in all this, Pandemics are unfair that way. Some people will be flat out immune or suffer only a little bit. If the social media of the people CDC has been compiling of people posting the more hideous infections is any indication, many millions won't be okay. And no one watching this knows which one they are. Not even the lucky Novid so far. Those are people who have had no COVID infections so far. COVID isn't over. Many Americans are over COVID. Those are two separate propositions, and both depend on the leadership provided by a political class focused on getting Americans back to work, whatever the public health danger. Back to jobs organized first and foremost around getting the rich richer. With here, as reported by the Economic Policy Institute, U.S. wages 1980 on falling far behind increases in the productivity behind record profits. Now, is that right? Is that so? We'll explore some of the details the rest of the broadcast. To start, the Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey reports that as of June, 11% of American adults who have ever had COVID-19 were reporting symptoms of long COVID, with nearly 16% of U.S. adults reporting they had long COVID symptoms ever. A total of 40 million Americans have experienced or are experiencing long COVID. 5% reported in July that they suffered some level of limitations on their activity. That translates to nearly 13 million people who feel their long COVID reduced their ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities. 
The Bureau of Labor is reporting disability claims are spiking to a new record of 34 million in June 2023. COVID is clearly contributing to a mass disabling event. And capital does not want to be caught holding the bag on the resulting damage. Jennifer Hulam is a medical doctor. She tweeted that her life insurance company denied her a policy on the basis of her long COVID. Not disability insurance, but life insurance. In other words, capital is betting against long COVID as a so-called precondition too risky to cover. Hulam writes, quote, pretty sure the insurance underwriters understand the risk of COVID better than public health and the general public, end quote. If a medical doctor can't navigate such a conundrum, think on the rest of the American people. California Supreme Court, meanwhile, ruled that employees can't sue their employers if they pass a COVID infection that they caught at work to a family member, even as in the example litigated in this case, even if the family member ends up on a respirator after the employer ignored San Francisco public health ordinances on quarantine, quarantining potentially infected employees. The takeaway, however, is the why the Cal court ruled this way. Such a duty to care would represent, quote, an intolerable burden upon employers. So the employer class that vigorously lobbied governments from the feds to states and local cities to roll back public health protections in order to send employees back to work is also now to take no responsibility for the damage that that position incurred. Indeed, employees are now being banned from even their own modest efforts at protecting themselves at work as in and out Burger's recent ban on employee masking underscores. The employer class is also aiming for the last of the professional managerial class who negotiate their way to working at home. As we touched on before, employers are aiming to set off a moral panic that remote work protecting people from COVID is worse for their health, including, as described in this Hill article, promoting, quote, a more sedentary lifestyle, which can contribute to blood clots, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, all ironically are caused by the COVID virus as if sitting at work all day is healthier than sitting all day at home. Commenters noted that a part of the two hours they save a day on commuting has been redirected to the exercise they weren't able to get previously. While essential workers were sent in to their infection, those non-essential workers of the professional managerial class were allowed to protect themselves by remote commuting, using their, commu com their computers at home but also by using boutique COVID prevention services for their big fancy events. You'll see the last listed in the frame of event scan clients. Yes, that's the White House. They're using this service of pre-event health screening, on-site testing, vaccination verification, antigen testing, PCR testing, thermal scanning that the White House claims the rest of the country no longer needs. The disparity in COVID control reflects the disparity in the very organizing principle of the country. While wages rot away in the face of inflation, price gouging, and declines in unionization, researchers recently reported 1.5 million of the wealthiest Americans socked away $4 trillion in offshore tax havens in 2018 alone. That's 5% of the $80 trillion total in US wealth. Not only is the surplus value workers generate privatized into owner hands as a matter of capitalist expropriation, but little of that wealth is taxed to cover at least some of the social shortfall that results, including the health damage from a still ongoing pandemic. And establishment public health is in the business of defending such a system, even unto the deaths and disability of millions of Americans. As in many sectors, under the Peter Principle, public health practitioners typically progress up to the position they fail at. I mean, that's a bit unkind on my part, but hear me out. So that's, that's, that's not a good situation, given the health of the millions involved. But beyond that, there's something worse. There's a moment in which successful ascension to the top slots in public health must include a security check for loyalty to the bourgeois program and a willingness to sacrifice the very principles of the field of public health in that effort. As David Wallace Wells prefaces his interview with former CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, quote, 
About two thirds of American deaths from COVID were recorded after Biden's inauguration day 2021, with the country experiencing a nine month surge beginning in the summer of 2021 that cost more than 350,000 their lives and had no parallel in our peer countries. Wallace Wells continues, quoting Wolinsky, I viewed my primary charge as bringing this country from the dark and tragic pandemic days into a more restored place, Dr. Wolinsky recently wrote. But critics of the new administration's handling of the COVID, Wallace Wells continues, have described the public health mission of the past few years in more cynical terms as the sociological production of the end of the pandemic, end quote. Wallace Wells asks Wolinsky, here, uh, shown here at the March 2021 press conference, she wept over the, quote, impending doom COVID could represent the American people. As CDC director, Wallace Wells asked, you presided over almost two thirds of the American COVID mortality. In retrospect, how do you think the country did in balancing those two impulses, the need to protect the, the vulnerable and the desire to return to normal? Now, she doesn't answer the question, instead blaming the American people, including those of us who were worried about the outbreak, who served only as just the other extreme to those who thought COVID fake. She replies, quote, when we are offering on average guidance, we could be very off for somebody at either of those two extremes. Somebody who has a lot of comorbidities, disabilities, or immunosuppression may want us to be incredibly protective. And those who have none of those and are very risk tolerant tend to be very liberal, if you will, with their activities. And that makes it very difficult to do, providing guidance for a country. At the extremes, you may dis displease both sides, end quote. As if governing for 300 million people was a surprise to her. Walensky also goes on to blame the unvaccinated as if, as if their deaths were not the government's responsibility in its failure of a vaccine campaign, and as if a third to a half of the dead uh, weren't vaccinated, as shown here. Both points Wallace Wells nails her on here as well as later in the interview. She replies, yes, but partly that's just a statistical phenomenon. Over time, it becomes the case that if 95% of your most vulnerable are vaccinated, by definition, the share of deaths is going to reflect the fact that you have a much larger pool of vaccinated people, end quote. But the vaccinations were sold as a categorical defense. Once vaccinated, it was repeatedly bantered, you were protected. Indeed, Walensky continues a milder version of her soft eugenicism for which she was condemned in 2022 to the effect that those who died were already suffering comorbidities or were elderly as, and so suffered fewer live years lost. Walensky also does a terrible job defending the CDC switch from recommending five days quarantine to 10, pointing out Americans weren't quarantining anyway, without unpacking what the Biden administration's role was in that, nor employers' efforts to lobby the CDC to make exactly that switch. She claimed the switch had no impact on the Omicron death surge, in actuality, the second largest in the pandemic. She also makes her repeated error conflating a centroidal measure and dispersion that 95% of new infections came from the first five days. It's the statistical tale beyond the five days that ends up driving the pandemic forward. Epidemiologist Karina Marquez's team showed in 2022 that of the more than 900 participants that were tested by rapid antigen tests five days after symptoms or their first positive test, 80% still tested positive for SARS-2. Indeed, as many as 20% continued to test positive at 14 days. The relationship held for the symptomatic and the asymptomatic and across vaccination status. They're not vaccinated, partially vaccinated, and fully vaccinated. Walensky also waves off Wallace Wells' query about the shift from the community transmission maps to hospitalization, hospitalization dependent community levels map as a matter of a change in the background of the pandemic, that we now had vaccines, et cetera. Even as Wallace Wells points out, we were in another peak of COVID deaths. Here in May, 2022, the community level map shows 76% of US counties under low danger, according to this map, while the agency's community transmission map shows 61% hosting high transmission. Walensky tries to have her cake and eat it too, and on, on other matters. First blaming many decades of public health uh, disinvestment, while also claiming data modernization, a CDC panacea, curing all these problems. She ends the interview on the importance of such data. 
that knowing which ERs are hosting surges and overdoses, for instance, is important in tailoring appropriate interventions, ER to ER. But she had earlier justified hiding away previously public, publicly available data at the county level, here now only a percent deaths, not the raw numbers, now only at the state level, that would have helped and would continue even now to help exactly such interventions for COVID. We see that kind of omissions now the order of the day. In her interview with Wallace Wells, Walensky notes the failure of the vaccination campaign is in part structural. Quote, we have an infrastructure in this country to vaccinate children. We do not have an infrastructure to vaccinate adults. It's in the president's budget, end quote. Not long after uh, this interview, the CDC announced it was reducing state's child vaccination budgets what the Association of Immunization Managers is reporting as 10% or more of the previous year's allocation, depending on the local public health department, coming during a pandemic when the number of children getting vaccinated dropped. MedPage Today reports, quote, agency officials linked the reduction in the vaccination budget to the debt ceiling deal recently struck by the Biden administration and Congress. The cut may result in less complete reporting on vaccinations, the CDC said. MedPage continues, the debt deal rescinded about $27 billion in unspent federal money that had been allocated to fight COVID. It, it has also led the CDC to remove $400 million in funding to states for workers who fight the spread of sexually transmitted infections, according to an email obtained by CQ Roll Call, end quote. We find rolling back disease protections ongoing elsewhere. The National Nurses Union reports that the CDC's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee, or HICPAC, plans to vote later this month in favor of rolling back measures for controlling infectious disease in healthcare settings, not just for COVID, but for all infectious diseases. Specifically, the committee, made up largely of healthcare management representatives and infectious disease clinicians and closed to the public, is calling for reducing respiratory protections for healthcare workers. Masking recommendations are to be reduced for one of two categories of aerosol transmission and a general basement standard locked to hospital budgetary needs would apply to all infections instead of the what had been pathogen specific standards. If COVID should have taught us the importance of previous protections, HICPAC is calling for adopting the crisis standards developed under COVID for all infection control under both emergency and non-emergency conditions. The National Nurses Union's Jane Thomason, an industrial hygienist, uh, explains that during COVID, these standards, quote, allowed and encouraged employers to race to the lowest standard to save money while not protecting healthcare workers and patients, all while saying they were following CDC's guidance. The comments from nurses and others underneath th this Instagram report are scathing. We should go on strike until we have universal health care. This shit is killing us, literally. This is exactly why they stopped checking healthcare providers for TB yearly. Now you just fill out a very brief questionnaire. They might check you as a new hire, but after that, nothing. Already seeing it, isolation orders, but we don't gown up for that anymore. Hmm, wonder if this is why normal chemo PPE has been slow to stock again. Exactly why I left direct patient care after 15 years. The budget cuts for child vaccines and clinic disease control are bookended by increasing denial of care. Medicare is becoming increasingly privatized. The Accountable Care Organization Realizing Equity Access and Community Health Model, or ACO REACH, launched earlier in the year. As Jake Johnson describes here for Common Dreams, the program, quote, inserts a for-profit entity between traditional Medicare beneficiaries and healthcare providers. The federal government pays the ACO REACH middlemen to cover patients' care while allowing them to pocket a significant chunk of the fee as profit, end quote. The Physicians for a National Health Program characterized ACO REACH as, quote, a threat to the integrity of traditional Medicare and an opportunity for corporations to take money from taxpayers while denying care to beneficiaries, end quote. PNHP also noted that the Biden administration greenlighted companies with track record of insurance fraud to participate in the program. In short, despite gestures toward universal, universal health care, including the still market-based Obamacare, this move represents a libertarian dream of turning bedrock programs like Medicaid and Medicare into moneymakers. Yes, the future doesn't bode well. 
with a public health fish rotting from the head. The top four candidates for president are all COVID crazy. Trump put half a million Americans in the ground. Biden, who won in part attacking Trump on COVID with promises to reverse Trump policies, put nearly double that down there. Strange that protecting poor and working people from such mass death and disability serves as no criteria by which progressive forces determine whether a democratic president has done a good job. Even as such a failure led so-called progressives, including Biden himself, to call for Trump's removal from office in the first place. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis began his state's fight against COVID with an aggressive combo of a state emergency, closed schools, shelter in place order, and partial shutdowns for beaches and stores, but switched to hard denialism, hiring denialist scientific staff, aggressively reopening businesses, fighting against mass mandates and proof of vaccination, and shutting down community vaccine centers even upon surges. Florida suffered an explosion of new cases in the summer of 2020 and throughout 2021. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a vaccine denialist and his campaign staff and fundraisers are supplied by anti-vax organizations like Children's Health Defense and ICANN. He recently declared that COVID was likely engineered in a lab in part ethnically targeted to spare Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people. Kennedy, who Rolling Stone reported says vaccine research caused HIV and the Spanish flu has declared, quote, I do not believe that infectious disease is an enormous threat to human health and has said that as president, he would target medical journals and redirect funding away from epidemiology. 2024 is already shaping up as a squabble over who abandoned the COVID fight the fastest. DeSantis even broached the possibility of appointing Kennedy the head of CDC or the FDA. COVID is only one of many fronts, labor, work and maternal is to be sacrificed. A new University of Washington study shows uh, the number of people in the US dying of pregnancy related causes more than doubled over the past two decades. The maternal mortality rate, deaths per 100,000 live births went from 12.7 in 2009 to 32.2 .2 in 2019. Black and Native American people faced the highest risks. The US has the highest rate of maternal deaths compared to other high, high income countries, Beth Mole reports here for Ars Technica. Despite spending far more on healthcare, both on a per person and share of gross domestic product basis. And while US maternal deaths have long been high, they've only gotten higher while other high income countries have seen declines, end quote. People CDC intern Kinsey Cantrell reports COVID has only made matters worse. She reported in-house, though the most recent CDC data is from 2021, it demonstrates a clear uptick. The maternal mortality rate for 2021 was 32.9 deaths per 100,000 live births compared with a rate of 23.8 in 2020 and 20.1 in 2019, representing a 63% increase from 2019. Contrell continues that the change isn't just a matter of lesser access to hospital care during the pandemic, already a damning comment on the US's zero sum public health strategy during a major pandemic. Research also indicates the COVID virus itself impacts maternal mortality with studies showing previous connections between MERS and SARS and maternal mortality morbidity. Quoting Cantrell, in the inter-COVID multinational cohort study, people with COVID-19 diagnosis were at higher risk for preeclampsia, eclampsia, severe infections, intensive care unit admission, maternal mortality, as shown here, preterm birth, severe neonatal morbidity and severe per uh, perinatal morbidity mortality, end quote. Other work showed pregnant people infected with COVID were at greater risk for ultrasound abnormalities, fetal growth restriction, premature birth, and postpartum depression. The U.S. appears moving back to the 19th century, putting those children who survive uh, maternity uh, to work in dangerous industrial factories. Three 16-year-olds died in five weeks from on-site injuries as state legislatures move quickly to loosen child labor laws that protect minors from hazardous, hazardous work. Soon to be ninth grader Duvan Thomas Perez died at the, at the Mar Jack poultry plant in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He followed Michael Schulz, who died upon sustaining injuries at the Florence Hardwoods Logging Company in Florence, Wisconsin. Will Hampton died after getting injured working at, at the Lee Summit Re Resource Recovery Park Landfill in Lee Summit, Missouri. HuffPost reports, the high school sophomore became pinned between a, a tractor trailer rig and its trailer resulting in his death, police said in a statement.
Now, the cause isn't just the shortage of labor, but the refusal of employers to follow federal law in their efforts to continue to pay cheap wages in such a labor market. At a time when even in the so-called post-COVID era, nearly 40% of Americans are struggling to pay their bills, a sharp increase from 2020 alongside an increase in Americans without enough to eat. The Biden administration is championing improvements in the economy, according to macroeconomic indicators and job numbers, uh, jobs often paying below inflation wages. In January, Biden tweeted on the impacts on housing, quote, today, fewer families are facing foreclosure and eviction than before the pandemic. People are, are starting to breathe just a little bit easier. In June, the Associated Press reported, quote, eviction filings are more than 50% higher than the pre-pandemic average in some cities, according to Princeton University's Eviction Lab, which tracks uh, filings in nearly three dozen cities in 10 states. Landlords uh, file around 3.6 million evictions every year. Among the hardest hit, the AP report continues, are Houston, where rates were 56% higher in April and 50% higher in May. In Minneapolis, St. Paul here, rates rose 106% in March, 55% in April, and 63% in May. Nashville was 35% higher and Phoenix 33% higher in May. Rhode Island was up 32% in May. The latest data mirrors trends that started last year with the eviction lab finding nearly 970,000 evictions filed in locations it tracks, a 78.6% increase compared to 2021 when much of the country was following an eviction moratorium. By December, eviction filings were nearly back to pre-pandemic levels, end quote. The AP quotes eviction lab researcher Daniel Grubbs Donovan, across the country, low-income renters are in an even worse situation than before the pandemic due to things like massive increases in rent during the pandemic, inflation, and other pandemic era related financial difficulties, end quote. From the economy, to the environment, with East Palestine residents still getting sick from that Ohio toxic train derailment, the Biden administration still refuses to declare the kind of public health emergency that grants Medicare payments for life to those affected. As the holding, holding Biden accountable Twitter account observes, the same still can't hasn't been done yet for Flint, Michigan, where residents were exposed to carcin carcinogenic levels of lead and trihalomethanes in the water. Climate change is now no longer a future for much of the world, but it's present. Beyond Canadian smoke in New York City, wet bulb temperatures are making outdoor life increasingly unlivable in some parts of the world, including now the US. But all such da damage from COVID to climate change is presented as all is well. CNN Business reports that President Biden has mentioned long COVID only twice since in office. Indeed, the happy days are here again, can't of declaring the pandemic over is deemed its own solution with, as AP reporting here, Biden aides saying they are encouraged by data showing Americans' views can be changed by a consistent message reinforced on multiple fronts, end quote. Indeed, Mandy Cohen, Rochelle Walensky's replacement as CDC director, pronounced the first order of business was reestablishing trust with the American people. Now, trust is an important epidemiological variable, but consistent messaging isn't enough. The failure of the COVID response wasn't merely a matter of a PR campaign. Cohen shared with NPR that the way back to that trust is first, transparency. Second, and only second, a good performance, although we need ask according to whose criteria. Cohen stuck to a Biden administration favor that we have all the tools, attacked which substitutes biomedicine for public health. Third, teamwork will help build trust, although with whom exactly? A $12 billion federal agency that leaned on the leadership of the largest corporations for public health advice, as in the December 2021 letter Delta Airlines sent recommending reducing COVID quarantine from five days, 10 days to five, isn't the kind of cooperation that serves public health performance. Indeed, it appears US governance is, is falling apart. And we're not talking about Mitch McConnell stroking out of the podium or Dianne Feinstein signing over power of attorney to her daughter, even while remaining senator of California. I mean, that's wild. But what we're talking about is the failure of a system to address the catastrophes of its own making. 
At the local level, counties and municipalities are unprepared both strategically and materially for pandemics, climate change, housing crisis, and all the other declines that we just reviewed. So for instance, in New York City this summer, the city administration dropped the ball when orange skies and record deterioration and atmospheric quality arrived with the Canadian fires. Now, it wasn't just a matter of the novelty of the event, but the utter failure of the imagination, indeed the celebration of such failures. Think about it for a moment, the New York Times quotes Mayor Eric Adams, what we should have done, put out the fires, come on, end quote. But the failures, as we describe at the federal level, have also been recognized even by the broader system, however much we might disagree with all its reasoning. The Fitch Rating Agency downgraded the U.S.'s long-term credit rating from AAA to AA+. The Biden administration launched an all-out PR attack on the decision, but it's the reasons Fitch gave that are the most interesting and largely buried at the bottom of the New York Times article reporting on the matter. Quote, Fitch released a statement that attributed the move to, quote, the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden, and the erosion of governance, end quote. Now, we might reject the problem of government debt as just another whack at austerity politics. To dump the capitalist problems on the kind of budget cuts for the poor Biden and congressional Republicans agreed on earlier in the year. But it's the erosion of governance, typically directed at the poorest countries of the global south, that is most telling. And against the New York Times, that erosion isn't merely a matter of Republicans playing chicken on the debt ceiling renewal. The federal government increasingly appears unable to govern for the American people, as long COVID patients and the people of Palestine, Ohio, can attest. The answer is to fight back, from labor picket lines, to strikes, to protests against budget cuts, to protests against hospital closings, to organizing bottom-up in preparation for more widespread collapse from neighborhood to region. For its part, the People CDC has been advocating for the public health Americans deserve. In quite the opposite direction of privatizing Medicare, one of its campaigns is calling on health workers to help champion universal health care, labor rights in the health sector, and broader health science education, among other demands. As we noted earlier, the CDC's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee, or HICPAC, advises CDC on infection control policies. HICPAC is made up of largely of healthcare management representatives and are subject to almost no public scrutiny. Policies are made with minimal input from patients or healthcare workers. The People CDC is calling for Congress to impose greater oversight upon HICPAC, including prioritizing patient and healthcare workers instead of hospital profit margins. The People CDC is waging a campaign to demand Congress and state legislatures to promote the CDC's increasing community access to testing program, or ICAT, to make the more accurate PCR testing for COVID free for all. The People CDC is calling upon Americans to push back against In and Out Burger's efforts to impose a no masking order upon its employees. As part of its efforts to educate both itself and the public, the People CDC is running a series of grand rounds with scientists and public health practitioners. This week, we're hosting Professor Mark Johnson on the basics and cutting edge of wastewater surveillance for detecting COVID-19. The presentation will be made available on the People CDC YouTube channel. Look, the People CDC isn't aiming to replace the CDC. The CDC should be the People CDC, not the employer CDC. But we see here by these efforts that another world is possible. So we'll post the links to all the campaigns and presentations we're ending this week's episode with in our video description. And that's COVID this week. We'll be back to our usual format next episode. You can find all COVID this week episodes on the People CDC YouTube channel. And you can learn more about the People CDC and read this week's COVID weather report at our website, peoplecdc.org.